All right, it's good time of day, everyone, and welcome to this new open MLIR meeting. Um, today, we're going to have mostly a discussion centered on the end to end flow um, for ML compilers, but probably beyond that. And uh, Stefan is going to introduce all of this with some slide deck. Stefan? Okay, so uh, I think we've all made a lot of progress. And, and I think MLIR continues to grow, which is great. Uh, and MLIR is, is becoming a great framework. So what this means to me kind of is that we have a lot of pieces. Uh, and, and the best analogy I have is sort of a, a big pile of Legos on the, you know, in the middle of my living room floor. And, you know, you, you sort of look at it and you go, oh, this is, this is so incredibly exciting. I can build it whatever I want, um, but I never know what to build. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, there is some value in both having instructions that say, you know, oh, well, here's how you build things, but also, you know, just having something cool uh, that, that's already built and actually, you know, you can look at. And so uh, I, you know, my, my analogy here is, you know, we need to take the pile of Legos that we have and actually build something that, that works and, and does something, uh, even if it's only of, of perhaps academic uh, use, like a, a Lego robot that solves Rubik's Cube puzzles. Uh, I think having having an end-to-end -end flow for machine learning in particular is going to be uh, really important. So um, I, I feel this. I, I think there's a few other people who are, who are also uh, interested. And in the kind of the goal of this meeting is to see how we can take all of the pieces that we have and really put them together to build uh, uh, something, something interesting. So I guess uh, my, you know, the, the sort of three big picture criteria that I see are, you know, this out of the box, uh, end to end, and and having it be community based. So, you know, for me, out of the box means that people can come to MLIR, they can download the repository, they configure, compile, and run. So without writing code and building dialects and figuring out how to use table gen, uh, people can get something out of, of MLIR. And, and kind of the best analogy that I have is, is with LVM. And in, in LLVM, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of code there, but what most people actually see is the Clang compiler driver, right? That's what, People can come to LVM, you can download it, you can compile it, and, and that's what you immediately start using. And almost everything else there is a means to make a better Clang compiler driver program. Um, and, and I think we need something similar. We need to take all of these, the, these different components and tools, and we need to come up with what the, the, the machine learning driver application is that, uh, that, that is really going to solve a machine learning problem. Um, the second thing is, I think I think it does need to be end to end. So we need to start with uh, frameworks that people are using for machine learning, like PyTorch and TensorFlow, and and you know other other frameworks are you know great, right? We should we should we should take all of the frameworks as input. Uh, we should we should do something with it, and then we should be able to target the hardware that people have. Um, which you know really means you know the CPU that I have in my laptop, the GPU I have in my laptop. Uh, we should also be able to support other hardware. Um, you know, definitely, you know, Xilinx is is interested in in selling Xilinx chips, and I think a lot of other people here are interested in all of the great machine learning accelerators that we can build. But all of that is kind of a a, a second step, right? The first step is well, you just got to get the code through the flow and compile it on a CPU. And then I need to compile it with a GPU to make sure that I get good performance. Um, and then the third part is community-based. So I, I think uh, we need to uh, have something where we have a lot of group ownership of the of what this sort of reference flow is, um, and that uh, this is you know having a good reference flow is good for everybody because it means that we can uh, everybody is in a position to to build off of it. And there's also something that we can sort of go show to people and say, ah, well, you know, MLIR is more than just a framework. It's more than just a bunch of pieces, but it actually does something and it solves a problem. Um, does that kind of, does that make sense to people? Do, do, do people have, have comments about this? 
I, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, sort of start the discussion. I have I have more slides, but uh, I think all of that is kind of the the, the details about uh, about how to make progress. Yeah, no, I I appreciate that, Steve, uh, and and I like that you have this convergence points. Uh, you have the different frameworks coming into a kind of a single representation, I would think, and then you do your compilation and then maybe you have a single representation that is your execution model that goes out to the different devices. Is that kind of what you're envisioning? Uh, I, I, I don't know what it is uh, yet. I think you know that's something that we should discuss, but uh, I, I think it's MLIR. <laughs> um, <laughs> And 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 we need to we need to kind of have a discussion about exactly what 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 it is, um, and and what are those those representations and what are the different uh, dialects that we're using in MLIR and how we're fitting it all together. Um, but to me, that's kind of the the, the second step, <laughs> right? That, mm -hmm. That's the kind of practicality of how we how we do this. Um, cool. Does anybody believe that that we don't need this? That ah you know you know MLIR should just be should just be infrastructure and 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 we don't we don't need something like this. Okay. Um, so be, before yeah, we move on, um, one thought. Um, I can I can uh, say many if you want me to. Oh. Oh, you're here, Sorry, no, no, I, I was. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical that mm -hmm. if it's built only as a toy, that it's successful in any regard in terms of becoming that. Like, if no one is using this in production and it's just a toy, then I don't think it serves the same use that Clang does, because Clang is a production compiler, and yes. people are investing. Like, companies are actually spending you know, X million dollars to make sure it's like really, really successful, really, really powerful. And if it's just a toy that lives in like examples, then like who is investing the effort? Maybe a few contributors here and there to make sure we have a flow, but like, is Google gonna use this? Is, you know, Facebook gonna use this? Is Apple gonna use this? Or is it just gonna be like, a, oh, look, MLR does something. You would yep. never use it. <laughs> it's not good. I but think that's a really good point, and and um, I think it I think it has to be a production uh, thing, um, and and one of the question you know sort of to me one of the big questions is as a community, what do we sort of look at and agree ah yeah you know that would be the 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 production that would be a product quality thing, that would be a product value thing for somebody. Um, and, and, yeah. and infrastructure for me to build my product around. Uh, so definitely, I, I think you know, for this to be useful, it needs to be more than an example. It needs to be more than a toy. I have one comment on that, uh, which is like it's more a question of a comment. Do we think one flow is enough? And if we say if we say we are building an end-to-end -end flow for machine learning models that is production ready. Uh, we are running a risk of that being the only flow and people no longer trying other things. And mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to make sure that it's not, a, like at least we're aware of the problem. I, I, I don't have a solution for that. Yeah. And I, I'm supportive of the idea that we should invest in a flow, uh, but we shouldn't actively prevent people from working on their own alternatives and looking at, into different things. Yeah, definitely. And And, you know, I think, Looking back at, at LLVM, I think there's been, uh, that hasn't been too much of a problem. I think people have been willing to go look at, at a lot of different alternatives. Um, so, you know, I don't think that Clang prevented any of that from happening, um, just to, to, as an analogy. But it, it is, a, it is an, a, an interesting concern. I, I also have a small comment uh, without elaborating too much. MLR is used in production at some scale, uh, some TBD, but uh, yeah, just wanted to put it out. Yeah, I think. Sorry, I, I missed that. You kind of were breaking up for me. Um, sorry, I was saying that an, another comment uh, on this was that MLR is today used in production uh -huh. uh, at Google in some scale uh, without getting into specifics. 
Yeah. So I think this is uh, from an from a non Google perspective, from the perspective of somebody outside of Google. Uh, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, but there's only so many times that I can hold up the, the, this poster that says, "Well, they're using it inside Google, but but we but it's hard to get access to outside ex externally, and it's not really in upstream MLIR." And uh, exactly, that that's not upstream MLIR. There are things that are necessary to currently use that in production that are not part of upstream MLIR. Mm -hmm. it's, I, and I think that the point of this discussion is whether they should be uh, or if not, where they should go, because there needs to be some like end-to-end -end usable thing, like you mentioned in the beginning. It's just that we have one locally. Uh, we actually have more than one. Uh, and that is yeah. part of the problem. Uh, yes, so you know, I think I think figuring out the the upstream thing. I think figuring out what works for, uh, you know, it, you know, if you look here, you know, Py PyTorch as well as TensorFlow, I think is a is an important question. Um, you know, what's the thing that people are going to download with in the MLIR repository and just get? Um, so I just wanted to come back to my question. I yelled into to River earlier. Um, because on the previous slide, uh, what you showed, and if you can go back, uh, is very consistent with what we showed originally, what was the plan for an LIR, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really what we wanted to achieve. And uh, so obviously, you're going to find a lot of support on my side, at least, uh, to do that. The question is like, why didn't we achieve it if this is what we wanted to do? And I cannot speak for all the community but I can speak for my side of the organization inside Google at least. And what I perceive is that this picture is very similar to, for example, XLA, right? This is already the ambition of XLA and this is what XLA kind of provides. Um, and all the efforts that Google has been making and that may explain why we have things in production inside Google has been incremental. Right, we've been incrementally using MLIR in those framework inside TensorFlow itself, inside XLA, um, and it's really difficult to start something new that does the entire end-to-end -end upstream when it's just going to be redundant to some extent with XLA. Yep. And so I'm just wondering, like, moving forward, how how would you like if you have thoughts on on this, like on the relationship between this picture and other things that try to provide the same thing? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. I, I don't know what the answer is, um, but I, I think the, the good news is that we do actually have m most of the pieces now. They don't necessarily all exist uh, sure. up, upstream, but you know, for the first time, I, I, I can kind of squint my eyes and I can see the path, I think, for for me, right, and and I'd like to to f hopefully feel like there's other people in the community who who also are are seeing the same path, and and that this is something that we can rally around and say, ah, yeah, you know, it is it is valuable to to have something which is a uh, I hesitate to say a, a standalone thing that 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 does it, that does this end-to-end -end, uh, flow at some level. Um, more than just, you know, fitting into XLA or fitting into the, the flows that, you know, a, a piece of the flow inside Google, I guess. So one, one question, I guess, that I would have here is how much of um the end-to-end -end pieces should be developed and first class citizen of the i guess llvm monorepo mm -hmm. versus imported from somewhere else so the, uh, the stake that i'm going to put in the ground is i think it has to be in the monorepo uh, because if it's not then it's just it it's not mlir it's some other project that's using MLIR. Right. So, and and, so, and maybe that's fine, but then it becomes the other project and it and MLIR doesn't sort of become the rallying point for people. Okay. Can it be a different project under LLM umbrella that is not MLIR? Like 
Flank is not LLVM IR, it's a separate project. So that does mean we should have like MLIR compiler on top of other uh -huh. infrastructure. I, I think that's a great idea. I, I think that would that would solve the problem from my perspective. Um, I haven't thought about those. Um, from my perspective, with an arm, we contributed the Charter dialect, and we started out from a very product-driven perspective. It's probably confused a few people regarding what Chasa is. I mean, it's an operator set. It's supposedly a compiler dialect, but it talks about processing. It talks about targeting hardware. So it's very product-driven. And along with Chasa comes a bunch of infrastructure, like the unit test infrastructure that we are trying to legalize. And I have a really productive conversation going on with Medi about it. So one thing we had in mind is that when you do something from a production point of view, we tend to iterate on the code a little slower when we interact with the public. So sometimes I wanted, but it would be nice to have some kind of a, some kind of a probationary report into which pieces that could ultimately go upstream into the mono report could sit usable publicly until it's become part of the MLR core up to the stand of the LLVM or MLR from the code cleanliness perspective or any other details. It could be an incubator project that could just work, but that's something I had in mind. Things coming out from a production perspective tend to operate a bit slower and come in sort of larger pieces because they're tested internally first before they go out. And if there's no easy way to deal with that, it might become a little more problematic to contribute things upstream or just add more friction and inertia to do so. So do you think, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what you're arguing for. Are you saying that we should have an end-to-end -end flow, but it should be in an incubator? Or are you suggesting that... Incubator for pieces that helps put together the end-to-end -end flow, yeah maybe some kind of okay. procedure here so you could go about contributing the pieces and then we could put them together but okay why, why not put them directly in upstream like what i heard is there are pieces that are not the same quality as the pieces we have upstream but you still want to share them and collaborate on them and it sounds like an incubator project but it also sounds like partly orthogonal to having an end-to-end -end flow we can have an an end to end flow that is production ready it is somehow more stable and another one next to it or like a, a staging ground uh that yeah. is complementary to that so I understand that was a concern that i had like i i'm in the research part of google and i i hear a lot of concerns like if you guys come and do research and break our production flow it's a problem uh but we, we still want to look at it we just don't want it in in our flows as it may break. Uh, so it, it feels like there are two different things that we might want for that reason. So are, are you uh, suggesting, Siddhar, that the, uh, you have more of an end-to-end -end flow, but you don't think it's production quality yet? And so this is something that you want to contribute? Or are you suggesting that after we have done this and we have a production tool that we should also have a a way of of staging changes to that that aren't yet ready for the production tool uh is this a now problem or is this a later problem i guess is what i'm asking um we have different pieces that are probably at different levels of code quality and development we could upstream things if it's useful for the community i don't see an end-to-end flow coming together all at once from everybody at the same level of quality and it's just about the mechanics of here yeah, i have this particular piece that's better off than another piece that's earlier along in development if you want to make them all work together you can but how do we make put it out in the public right. place so so i think th there is a question of of maturity and how we communicate maturity and yeah. and at this point you know it, it, i i think we should aspire to something which is a product quality but before we get there, we need something which isn't product quality. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe maybe trying to understand the quality question too soon isn't is going to get in the way of something that works well enough to to fill the hole. Yeah, and we I should first talk about how we how we build something that's bad. 
and and then we can get to something that's a good product from there. Does that make I'm sense? Sure that bad, is, bad, bad should be a goal, but uh, that makes sense. Uh, the goal uh, isn't uh, bad. Uh, the goal is let's not worry too much about making a product first. Right. Uh, yeah, it kind of it kind of seems like the the clang driver analogy is kind of what you're looking at. Something that's outside that basically puts these pieces together and you know builds the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Kind so of what this thing way. Just that uh, we 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 try to use the raise hand uh, so that people don't talk over each other. And Mahesh raised the hand uh, already Got just before. So I just want to yield to to Mahesh right now. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, so um, I'm trying to understand what the end-to-end picture here means. If you want to look at like, a project that is being using MLIR end-to-end, it is a project that is primarily using MLIR end-to-end. There's nothing not MLIR in EE, and it does try to connect all of these pieces. It's not production quality yet, but it's a path of being production quality. That's not to say that EE should be this incubator project. The question I have is, if we start this incubation, if we start this incubation project that is supposed to be end to end, what are the design concerns that it? What what is the space that it was solved? Because mm-hmm. it started off being like something that primarily targets, uh, you know, small fa- fa- form factor devices, which for now. It's gone past that. We are he's also looking at CUDA and training and and uh, training birth models. So figuring out what exactly an incubator product will address, as well as the specific design choices it makes, which would be something that most people would be interested in, would is is not clear to me because I'm trying to see how. I'm trying to see what it would look like if it was not look like what ED does. So like what why would why would something need to be in the in the in the LVM mono repo versus something like ED that is not part of a MLIR mono repo or LVM mono repo, but is uh, primarily based on MLIR and is one way to to do this and have many such projects in the open that use MLIR in a, in a load bearing fashion like EV does. Yeah. So, so I think the difference, it, it comes down to external perception and it may be that Erie is the answer. And, and the solution to this problem is that we should take Erie and we should push it into the mono repo as a separate project. And it becomes the basis for that upstream end to end flow. I think that the perception that people have right now is that MLIR doesn't do it and Erie isn't upstream and so it's not uh, robust or mature or or something, right? But I think it all comes down to perception. Like if we, if we get these things together and they're close enough together, then they'll be, uh, they'll be associated with each other. And, and MLIR will be able to, uh, to, to, to grow from that because they're going to be very tightly coupled. And, and I think until that tight coupling happens that they're just, we just have a, a sea of different projects and, uh, there's no one good, robust central path. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the other question I have would be timeline, like, We've been working on ED for close to two and a half years, almost three years now. I've been working on it for two and a half years, and people have been working on it from before that. And we are only now getting to a stage where we can say, okay, it actually does decent in some use cases that we are looking for, and also have some evidence to say that even the use cases that we are not looking at, it does well out of the box. But that's very limited. Mm-hmm. So the timeline for this seems like it would take years. Uh, uh, in what you don't what you don't say in what you're saying is that the reason why Stefan talked about this today and said that right now you can see you said something earlier Stefan about today you can start to squint and see these pieces appearing upstream is because of this work you've been doing in Yuri for the last two years a lot right. of the cogen and Lina like what you see on this slide Tosa Lina etc 
is due to the last two years of working near it. So it's not like the walk upstream would start from scratch, right? It's, it's, That's it. And it's sharing a lot, like the fact that we have those projects, um, like Yuri, like XLA, uh, we should, I, I would hope, at least uh, coming from an XLA side, that we could be able to reuse 90% of what's there inside XLA uh, for CPU or GPU, for example. Um, and, and collaborate on that, right? So there is no, there is no like, it's not completely redundant and, and, and do anything. But we have, a, I, I, I yielded earlier to Maesh because he raised his hand and Simon has his hand raised. Yeah, no, I just uh, want to add uh, kind of to that idea. You know, you mentioned, the, uh, Maddie, the uh, TensorFlow and XLA path, and there's, you know, there's also the TFRT path that's being developed and, uh, there's several different paths, uh, and it seems like many different ways to get a model to go through MLIR. Uh, and I think what Steve is kind of pointing out, we've talked about this in the past, is, you know, is there a convergence point for the high-level model where all of these frameworks can feed into? And then we can, as, you know, as building the middle end there can can insert our own pipeline for our own targets for different targets or, or for different optimizations that we want to do or restructuring and then maybe have a convergence point uh, at the end where we we have our execution flow which I think Erie has done a, a lot of work there building this uh, execution flow that can target the different devices in the back end. Does that make sense? Yeah. So how do we take all of this work that's happening and distill it into the the thing that should be upstream, I guess is is my, my question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, like to, a driver. There is well, one uh, challenge that yeah. we haven't really mentioned mm -hmm. And, and River raised the hand, I think is next. Uh, one challenge that hasn't been mentioned uh, and that Simon kind of alluded to by referring to TFRT is that we're writing a compiler here. And so you take graphs uh, at some point you go to Linux and when you get to Linux, you're in the code gen side of things, right? You're gonna generate native code out of Linux or core libraries, but in the end you, you generate something that the device will execute. There is also a runtime integration question. Right. You need some orchestration to some pieces between different pieces of the graph. And now you get into, do we want how much opinionated upstream MLIR should be on the runtime? Because both TFRT or, or ERE even more uh, takes a fairly opinionated stance into the lower level, like the, the, not the cogen side of things as much as the, the, the runtime flow of things and the runtime interfaces. And I to think some extent, to some extent, there should be some sort of, if you want this to be reusable, right? You want the compiler to stay reusable. So you don't want to anchor too much to one runtime, but you also need to, the compiler and the runtime needs to be integrated together. So there is, there is a tension between. Maybe a, a standard, standardized uh, execution graph uh, or runtime graph that potentially has uh, different kernels for different targets, even if you wanted to integrate in a heterogeneous way. Uh, but yeah, maybe a, a standardized execution graph. Maybe, right? I think there's a lot of possibilities there. And, and you know, I, I agree that we shouldn't necessarily preclude anything. Um, but at the same time, I think we do need to pick something that right now is is the thing that we can rally our community around. And were there other other questions that we wanted to discuss, or should I? We continue? have two hand raised, uh, River and Suraj. I think River was uh, sorry. River removed his hand for now. Suraj, you want to well, I mean, I wasn't sure if I have to remove it before I talk or if I just keep it up. Okay. Good. Uh, um, what? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Go what ahead. What is going to? If you can. Sorry, go ahead, roll. It's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, 
The runtime is a really big one, but I think the thing that falls into that that hasn't been discussed is that just because Imlayer exists doesn't mean people agree. Uh, I mean, if you ask, like, Imlayer has it's been developed as an infrastructure to make things easier, but people have just been using it to improve their current flows. It's not really merging flows, really. So, I mean, if you ask, it's like, oh, what model should we, like, what, what, what execution model or development model should we take? Uh, if you ask someone on the XLA, they might have a different answer, likely, than the Erie team or the PyTorch team. So I don't think that just because Emlayer exists it has actually solved any type of problem in terms of what the modeling should be. Uh, and I think just taking one of them is not going to solve anything, because if we just take Erie, for example, you know, someone else is going to be like, well, Erie is not good at this. Now my thing exists. Um, I would love to we, see that. I would love to see people go, ah, you know, that that flow that is in MLIR is so bad that I have to go fix it. And well, I made something that's 50% better or 5x better. It's, it's different, though. If you're, like, if Erie has an entire design model, and if your design model is different, you can't just say, I'm going to make it 10% faster if you're like, okay, I need to completely disregard that entire stack to have my stack instead. And now you have two compilers, two runtimes in, in, in tree. If it's if it's that much of a difference, then like, like what isn't clear to me is how much you're sharing in the runtime aspects in terms of like your scheduling model, how you dispatch computations, things like that. If those aren't shared, then you're running the risk of, okay, you have Clang, you have GCC in tree, you have Borland maybe, although no one really uses that anymore. Um, it's like it isn't clear to me the scale at which things can be shared, and the runtime part is an, a really important aspect of that because that's a very large portion of what Erie's doing. I, I, I guess my opinion is that I'd I'd like to get to the point where we have that problem, and you know, even it, if you do look at LVM, for instance, LVM is well the middle end. And then there's Clang, which is the front end. And then there's uh, the libc. And there's the compiler runtime. And there's actually a lot of support stuff that goes into making it all work. And I think we need to get to the point where we are, where we're dealing with those problems. I think we've actually been dealing with them from the beginning because Especially from the Google side, a lot of things have been hesitated to just upstream because they're so opinionated for mm -hmm. the current flow. And that's always been the breaking point. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm positive we can get there, but I, I think the discussion needs to be around, do we even agree as a first off that someone is, is better or good enough of a starting point? I think if we don't have a good enough starting point at by after at this point, then we are going to get. Uh, and I say this in a good way. I think we're going to get out impacted by other frameworks that are out there that are also trying to solve this problem and are and are making opinionated choices. I mean, I would be hesitant to say what do you mean by framework, because for me, MLIR is an infrastructure. TensorFlow is a framework, PyTorch is a framework, whether you use MLI or not, it, it doesn't change the fact that TensorFlow is TensorFlow, I guess. Mm -hmm. but... uh, Siraj, did you also have a comment? Right, so I kind of lost my train of thought here. <laughs> um, so. I was going to say that the runtime question is really important to us and something we had been looking into because I'm just trying to describe what we want out of those. And we want very close connectivity between the level of end to end flow and the design of the runtimes because their potential quality of service levels we want out of a runtime. It could be something that is very trivial, lightweight for some kind of an embedded target, or it could be something that's dropping a big honking multi-GPU, multi-CPU thing. And it could be multiple runtime, but we want to be able to do that. 
And one of the problems we face here is that trying to drive the adoption of MLIR and getting pushed back that we can't use it yet because it's not production ready and you can't make it production ready unless you work on getting together the pieces like this, exactly what the meeting is about. So, yeah, that's where we are. Okay. Um, so I, I was going to try to switch, uh, you know, I, I think we've kind of been uh, touching on this a little bit of like, you, you know, maybe that uh, we, we don't know what, what success means. Um, and, and, and in, in lieu of that, the, the answer, it, it's easy to, to, to say that, well, we don't have, we shouldn't do anything. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to kind of put out a few stakes in the ground that I thought would, would be success for me and to try to hear what other people thought that they might find, you know, a, a characteristic of success. Um, so, so one thing that I think uh, I'm starting to see more of is that it is like uh, benchmarks like ML Commons and ML Perf uh, that are where where the framework of what uh, of of what the benchmark is, or or that uh, a particular implementation of the benchmark says, ah, oh, well, you know, we're using TFRT version seven, right? And and that's what people are advertising, um, and I think here. MLIR needs to start showing up in the list, right? If people aren't looking at MLIR as this is one of the benchmark reference flows that we are using to get performance, then I think we're not as successful as we could be. So, I, you know, to me, success says that people are using MLIR to build those benchmark frameworks, uh, to, to publish their benchmarks, right? To build their implementation of the benchmark. Um, I think an, another piece of success is when we get to the critical mass where people are building tools on top of MLIR to solve machine learning rather than interfacing MLIR to PyTorch or interfacing MLIR to TensorFlow, which is basically what's happening today. Um, you know, when, when MLIR has such good code generation and good infrastructure that people are building new frameworks on top of it, then I think that would be an awesome success. Um, and, and, you know, at least personally, I, I, you know, I think MLIR needs to get to the point where the people around me don't, don't question it anymore. <laughs> and that it, if, if we got to the point where the performance was so good or the value was so good that people just assumed that MLIR is, is the framework that you're using rather than something else, then I think that would be, that would be a great step forward for me personally. Uh, do other people have thoughts about what what you know success might be? Some kind of working workflow implementation and something like here. I think what they have done there is quite phenomenal work. Something that shows people that somebody is using MLR and making things run end to end fast, and a bunch of use cases where they can actually try to run something and see something running out. And it seems pretty good. That's a great measure of success to begin with, I think. What would make it really phenomenal? Or what makes it phenomenal? Is it is it just performance or is it existence or is it something else? Well, just the existence of a flow to begin with. Uh, I mean, here is pretty much the only theory in town, at least in the open source. You know, are there any other? So um, I have some like thoughts, but this is just, um, just my own thoughts. I think to something like MLR is more like a, I mean, maybe I'm not that good an, an analogy, but I mean, if you think about C++, and that's used everywhere almost for developing various frameworks or tools or whatever. And uh, it is not actually showing up in benchmarks and stuff, but it is indeed the underlying underpinning tool and uh, like, thing that powers everything. And that's, I think it's been very successful. I think MR being like an infrastructure is something kind of similar to that. It's eventually need to have these products to show that successful and then that is makes, makes MR itself successful. Um, I 
find it a bit hard to like directly link the MR itself to benchmarks and stuff. Um, also, MR is a good way to actually simplify like lots of things and on the developing side. You use it to write passes in the patterns, and it brings very nice and good tooling for that. That is like production. And that, that is like developer productivity stats aside of the things, which is not very easy to quantify anyway, but it's also super important. And I, I think that's also a measure of success. Yeah, so it's actually interesting if I can sort of like summarize some of the things. I think we're still sort of hearing two views in terms of MLR being batteries included or not, and also what does batteries mean at what level it is. Um, so, I mean, like, that's a different discussion which will probably go on for a while. I think one of the success things here, to actually on one of the comments as well, like the end-to-end the -end flow where a novice can just pick up the tool and use it. I think one of the things that Erie has done really well is the fact that here's a Hello World guide. Here is like, oh, well, if you are used to your, your PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatnot, here's how you would write it, here's how you would integrate it. So I think one of the success here actually would be the ability of somebody to be able to use a framework they're used to and pass it through like an MLR pipeline. You know, so basically, like I, I think that is a requirement. Like it has to be like for novice, it should not be the uh, where I get started, right? It's, that shouldn't be like that amount of flexibility. There should be a I can I can use it from from like day one, starting from things that I know. And I think that that's one of the things for me where, where Erie has done actually a very good job in, in positioning that. Mm -hmm. Just on the on the side of novice developers wanted just to play with something end to end, which is a bit different from I'm using the framework I'm used to, like I'm using TensorFlow or I'm using PyTorch. Um, we we I know Art has been and Bisha have been working on something for reproducing what Taco has, which is also a end-to-end -end framework where you can write Python, write a computation that looks like a tensor comprehension and JIT execute it directly from Python. And I think they want to upstream, it's like two Python, like all the pieces are upstream. What's missing is like two Python files that glue everything together and give you this tensor comprehension. And that should be upstream this month or next month. So, so we're gonna have those kind of things that are more toy though than production end-to-end -end ML compiler. But that's that answers the, that's another way, uh, those kind of, mm -hmm. of uh, toy to answer the end-to-end -end flow example so that novice can pick up, you know, development in ML. I didn't mean to, to disrupt, to like uh, disrupt the discussion about the production aspects, but PyTaco, I mean, uh, Art comments on the, the chat that it's called PyTaco. Or maybe we can have a presentation about PyTaco next time. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I, th I think we've talked a lot about uh, Erie at this point. Um, and you know, I think my understanding is that a lot of the focus right now is on uh, improving the performance of the generated code. Um, the other, uh, another piece that we haven't talked about right now is, is this, uh, proposal to go from through TOSA and using the emit C dialect to, to generate either uh, Eigen or the uh, TOSA reference model that uh, Marbury was proposing. Um, so maybe that's another, uh, another path or another piece of the puzzle. Are there other, and, and we just talked about PyTaco, are there other uh, sort of proposals for what this end-to-end -end flow could look like, or things that we can copy liberally from, or things that we could upstream quickly. Uh, Marius? Yeah, well, actually, we have the same also for TF going down to mhalo. And then to emit C to C++. Um, so we are not targeting performance. This is more uh, a reference implementation we have right now. Um, 
we can of course upstream that um, to MLIR core when it is interesting for the community. Um, so far, we can, for example, show yeah models like MobileNet V2, lowered uh, via the path uh, shown on the slide to C++, and it at least demonstrates how one could use MLIR um, and one, what we, you could do with it. Another path would, of course, be not using MHC but um, LLVM IR and uh, lower it directly into an executable. So a conceptual thing I had struggled with here. Um, when we talk about having any kind of reference implementation, whether the TELSOL reference model or the one Mary always just spoke about, it kind of turns the MLR flow to some kind of uh, a functional simulator as opposed to a compiler. So I'm not quite sure how the two sit together. How, the two. Uh, how do the community view it? I guess, yeah, that kind of gets to uh, what what I was talking about. And I know we, we talk about all the challenges with an execution flow, a, a standardized execution model. Uh, but um, if there was a kind of a, uh, a standardized model that could at least represent, you know, here are, here are the, you know, kernels that need to be called whether that's CPU, GPU, whatever, uh, with the synchronization points, um, then uh, I, I just see a lot of uh, uh, runners being built for for this. But I think it it kind of follows the um, you know the C plus plus code generation executable generated, and then you can take that executable and run it on any you know. Uh, standard platform that supports it. Uh, if we if we had a standardized execution model, then uh, then it would be more portable, and so you could have a, you know compilation in one place and then run it anywhere, right? So you're you're thinking about a kind of a runtime handoff uh, thing, like Erie right, does, right? And TFRT is already talking about that with their BEF uh, format. Uh, you know, is that is that it? I don't know, but uh, um, the, it, you know, I see these these popping up everywhere, and we've we've built our own runner, and I know other people have built their own runners, and uh, and they all kind of have some some semblance of, of standardization, but maybe make that more formal on the, the, the model representation, the execution model. So, so I think one thing that's important to me that, that we haven't really brought up is the difference between training and inference. And a lot of times for inference, sure. the, the things that you want to do are slightly different for, than for training. You know, so so in inference, you might end up with this you know separation between the place where you're doing compiling and the place where you're doing uh, deployment. And at deployment time, things don't change very much. Whereas in a training context, they can actually change quite a bit, um, and that maybe leads you down a different set of design decisions. Um, so I think you know a, an interesting question that I have is you know for for does machine learning that does this machine learning flow mean an inference flow? Or does it mean a training flow? Or does it mean both? Or does it matter? Um, <laughs> I think becomes a, a kind of an interesting, uh, you know, decision point. Um, so I, I just want to add to what you said, uh, when you said things can change. There's another thing that is a bit fundamental. Uh, frequently, when we talk about inference, we're talking about a single device. Um, that receive request and process inference. Whereas for training, uh, in general, we scale it to multiple devices, multiple hosts, clusters of things. And that includes then communications. And you could ignore this. You could say that the compiler only targets one device and you go back to the runtime anytime you need to do communication or things like that. 
But uh, if you look at what XLA does, uh, XLA models directly the entire cluster of devices and has very advanced and powerful thing that it does to manage this as a wall. Um, the model is not ESPMD, but but it's 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 interesting and yeah. challenging. Yeah, I, I think distribution is an is an interesting question, right? And um, how how do how do we go solve the distribution question in MLIR? I think is a is a very interesting thing that maybe we not a lot of people have looked at so far. I have another angle also. That is not training and uh, inference, but I, uh, I, I still bring it up now. It's that if, because I, I mentioned XLA and XLA as a model where the entire graph that you give to the compiler is single device, but not single device, but is device, not host and device. Meaning, I'm going to give the graph and I'm going to say run this on my four GPUs, but all the ops in this graph are. Um, Going to run on GPU, going to be compiled. Whereas you have other models, like if you if I take a TensorFlow graph on the surface, it looks like a data flow graph, just like the XLA graph. But the TensorFlow graph will have up that are intended to run on the host and ops that are intended to run on the device. And uh, this is also another degree of complexity in terms of what it means for the compiler. Yep. So I, I maybe that leads us into. I, 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 we had some discussion online uh, beforehand, and I tried to capture some of those uh, questions here. And I think we've actually touched on a lot of them already. Um, you know, we talked about runtimes. Um, we talked about how to maybe retarget things. Uh, I think this this last question is is a an interesting one that we haven't discussed so far. Like uh, that part of what made Clang successful was that it. Uh, was a basically a drop-in replacement for GCC, and it looked really similar, and so it was really easy for people to adopt. And so, you know, I guess the the question that I kind of put out to the community is, you know, what are the existing use models that are worth copying, or is this a place where there's not really anything that that is uh, entrenched enough that is worth uh, mimicking, and we should we should sort of go it alone and figure out our own. Uh, our own way to, to to expose our tool to a user. There's potentially any additional access here, you know, both of the end-to-end -end flows and an online flow. The online, I mean, something like an eager process of trying to build something in wallet versus an offline flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody else have any other comments? I think we're reaching the top of the hour. Is the you know I I hear a lot of people who are really uh, positive about Erie. Should we you know is this the time that we should push hard to at least take components of Erie and start getting them upstream? I think or we I should think push for. Highly... With, I'm part of the people who talk highly of Erie because of what they achieve in terms of end-to-end -end flow, right? Which is what I always wanted them and I to be. Um, but we have to, to keep in mind like some of the specificity, like how much you can take of Erie that will not be purely Erie specific. Um, how opinionated is the Erie model in terms of some of the thing it does? What, what can I reuse really in like, in XLA, for example, right now, there's a large push to use TFRT in on CPU or GPU. Like, I'm not sure yet how much we're going to be able to keep as commonality other than Linux co-generation, right? I think Linux to, how, how I get from Linux to generate a, a GPU kernel is like, seems to me totally common, hopefully. But there are lots of things about the model otherwise that can can be fundamentally different. Yeah, I to, I agree. To give an example, the way ED partitions the work at, is a, is fundamentally different from what actually exists in core to some extent. There is a place where there is a 
for GPU core 10, where the host device separation happens and the way it exists in core is fundamentally different from how it's done in EV. So it's not a, it's, uh, it's first, yeah, it's not clear that the way EV does it is something that everybody would immediately latch onto as the solution. It's a solution that we are exploring. So, uh, but I, you, I, like, I myself am not convinced that it's a solution for, that works everywhere, especially if you're targeting like clusters, right? That's a completely, like we explicitly do not target distributed code generation, so. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that's a fundamental limitation or is that just that we haven't figured it out yet? Or, uh, it, I, I mean, I, I, I think it, it, it's, it, we need to, it's important to not feel like we have to boil the ocean and solve everybody's problem because then it's likely that we're gonna solve nobody's problem. Uh, and, you know, so if, if you know, we sort of look around and, and people feel that Erie solves enough of an interesting problem to that, that, that it's a good place to start with, or that it maybe uh, solves some problems really well, then I think we, you know, we should focus on those problems and say, look, we're going to focus on these problems for a while as a, at, at least as a, as a community and that Erie becomes the reference by which we decide what are the other solutions that we need. Yeah, I think for me, the problem statement is important. Uh, once you have a problem statement, we can see if Erie has a solution for it and, and build a solution in core that is probably inspired by it, we might be able to reuse it directly. Uh, but I think, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of trying to understand what the problem statement of what we wanted to solve in core is because that will influence the design. Maybe I can flip it around and say, uh, is there a good reason why at least the first, the first problem isn't whatever Erie solves? Yeah, but there's all whatever other, pro all other problems should be considered relative to that. I, I'm, I'm not sure. For example, I mentioned everything that XLA does before. Like XLA does much more than Erie, right? So why isn't the problem statement whatever that XLA does? Do we think that we can upstream XLA as part of LLVM and that that's, that's what we're talking about? We're talking about, we're talking about problem statements, not about taking code and moving it around. Well, it's, it, it's both, right? Um, uh, well, but that's where I'm uncomfortable because now it seems like there is an agenda. Like I have strong concern about just moving the code. Yuri is very researchy and, and experimental. And I have strong concern about moving anything like that upstream. Yeah, it wouldn't be okay with just dumping Yuri. It would have to go through like extensive cleanups, changes, like formalization, making sure the problem statement is well designed in certain use cases. And I think the same would be true for XLA or whatever other solution. So I think right now it's just anchoring on Erie because it is MLIR and it exists, not necessarily that it's like, the thing that we should do, it's just like, well, this thing exists, let's just take it and build from there. So what should we do? What, what is the, th what does it look like? What is the thing that looks like that is, that is the thing that should be upstreamed and how do we get there? I mean, if, if we look at what we have upstream, like the, the main usable thing or the main thing that looks like ML upstream is TOSA. Uh, the next thing would be Linav, but it's like one step away from what we think in terms of ML usually. And, and we can start by saying like, we would want to have, you know, just be able to take a TOSA model and run it, benchmark it, because some of your success criteria was having benchmarks, right? I think if, if you could have like most mobile net or, or, or ResNet or whatever model encoded in, in TOSA and benchmark them upstream. Right? Um, and getting to these points is probably the most important. And we don't necessarily need to go too far in the runtime to do that because we stay in turn, so we have single device. Um, we, we can uh, co-gen almost everything. We have almost no need for complex runtime if you do that. Uh, we have all the pieces. Even in terms of, of uh, like with the async dialect, you can cogen the host part being asynchronous and etc. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can get to an end-to-end -end story that is 
like the bad thing you were talking about without having to solve the hard part, which is, you know, looking deep into the opinionated choice of theory versus XLA CPU versus XLA GPU uh, thing that happens at the same time outside of MLA. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this, so, just to add to so, what Mehdi said. Sorry, Stefan, just to add to what Mehdi said, I think that is important, like making the runtime really like not an issue at this point would probably be a good starting point because like if you look at the EE, EE is explicitly a host device model, and I don't know if there is anything that it, if that even makes sense at this point to have a separation between host and device, like it might just be easy to say, I'm just going to compile for x86, a simple MM model, which is written in TOSA. And it's just like you take a function in C++ and you would just compile it, it will generate all its code and you just call it. It's like compiling main without having to do like, whole, you know, like CUDA side where you have a launch and a driver and all these other complexity that happens. I think that that would be a good starting point probably for people to at least see, okay, these are the things that if I have an ML model, which I write as a function, I just compile it down and and, and run it. Mm -hmm. That that seems like a good starting point. I, 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 it sounds good to me. I guess the only, the only small tweak that I would, I would, hope to get is that I don't think anybody is going to be writing a TOSA model, that all of the real users are writing C code or they're writing Python or they're writing PyTorch. And we need to have a way to, to, to connect to that, um, which is more of the, you know, it, how, how do, you know, the, the Torch MLIR question, or how do we have a tool that links easily that, that is upstream in MLIR and links easily against TensorFlow, for instance. Um, I would I would spin it the other way, which is if everything upstream, uh, if you have a TOSA compiler upstream, right, that can do uh, JIT and execute, for example, it should be easy to add a TOSA plugin to TensorFlow so that in TensorFlow you can do import MLIR TOSA compiler and, and use it. So let me, okay. that, that's another way to plug into the framework for the two users. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's how XLA works, right? No one writes XLA HLO. Yet when we publish benchmarks, we all publish TensorFlow XLA or PyTorch XLA benchmark. So there are several raised hands. I think Nicholas raised the hand several times. And then Suraj. I'm in the wrong windows. Thanks, Alex. Yes, boss. Please go ahead, Nicholas. Um, yeah, I guess I had a comment slash question as we went full circle again, but I think it, the opportunity has passed again. So let's see. Uh, I seem to hear from the one of the latest statements that Stefan uh, Stefan made um, that uh, I heard that programmers program in C, Python, or I guess machine learning framework. Is that relatively accurate? Uh, it, it not to the exclusion of anything else, but I doubt they're writing uh, TOSA models, I guess was the point I was trying to make. I see, I see, okay. Yeah, because the, the, the follow-up question I had is, is a NumPy uh, type of specification in Python uh, or a NumPy-like programming model acceptable as an entry point? Ah. The reason I'm asking is because depending on NumPy is very easy re-implementing a uh, tensor library, et cetera, et cetera, just for the sake of having it in MLIR is a very different discussion. Sorry, y'all. Uh, I've been told by multiple people that we're talking about a really interesting topic, but I was out sick this morning and didn't know. Did, did you want to comment, Stella, or did you have something to add? Um, I just woke up and opened my computer and found a lot of people saying, uh, this, seems really, this seems somewhat disorganized and like we didn't pull the stakeholders together. Um, you know, it's kind of late. Uh, I guess, Nicholas, do you expect a, an answer to your question about NumPy, or was it just a comment? Well, I guess I, at, at this point, I, I'm not expecting an answer, but... Uh... Well, well, it feels like the NumPy is probably the best thing we can get 
fast enough because we already depend on NumPy for Python tests. So it's not like we're bringing something totally new. Okay, uh, Suraj had his hand raised, I think. Um, yeah, so this is the context of what Mahesh had been speaking about and regarding the AORA path and the potential specialization of the approaches they have taken there on the host device side in, in general. We've seen something like that, we've struggled with that, and thing is, if you try to up force something to be upstreamed at the MLI core, potentially what you need there is some kind of idea of how to modularize certain sub-problems such that the upstream actually contains an interface that lets you invoke a particular specialized way of maybe schedule like on the GPU, or for example, some kind of a custom accelerator with its own requirements so that the code contains a way to get there. And particular end to end implementations can implement specialized paths that may have their own limitations or maybe constraint to their own requirements so that the code could, we could start out by defining that there's a small problem that can be exposed using some kind of an API that can allow you to implement your own specialized form of the solution and then continue. It could be scheduling or memory access to the GPU or to an accelerator like the TPU or whatever. So the code will continue the common path that from where people can take different specializations. The usual answer to that is use interfaces. We have a lot of those in MLR and we should probably have more, but it's hard to define what that interface is without having like three or four different solutions to the same problem. So uh, I usually advocate for saying, well, everybody needs their own runtime. So we can just we can try to sit down and figure out what is the perfect runtime or what is the runtime interface. But unless we have like, four different working runtimes, we're not going to get that interface right. So it's like, let, let, let's try building those and keep talking. The important part is keep talking as we go and then we can converge. I think we're gonna have uh, probably a follow up to this, uh, this yeah. session today uh, because it uh, was uh, just a good way to scratch the surface on the, the direction, maybe more than scratch the surface. I think it's, it's great that, that we do that, but we already had those discussions in the past. And if we want to keep momentum, we may have to like have a regular sync on that to make progress so that we keep things paging in memory. We don't have to rehash the same content over and over. Uh, whereas if we pause for six months, we're gonna go back to almost from scratch. Um, maybe we can also start to write a collaborative doc you know, to lay down, like try to lay out the lay of the land on the possibilities, like a Google Doc shared amongst everyone, and then have more, like maybe weekly sync outside of the open meeting on people who want to like hash down this topic. That's how I would maybe propose to move forward with this right now. I don't know, Stefan, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's probably uh, pretty reasonable. I guess I, I, I've heard a few things that, uh, that, that maybe give me a, a, a little bit better idea of what I think would would be interesting to people upstream. Um, so probably what we should do is start trying to capture that in a in a design proposal, and then uh, come back and and present again. Yeah. So I'll do that. What I do, what I propose to do, is starting a thread on Discord to point at the doc ask people to join and then I'll set up uh, or I talk to whoever is interested, raise interest to make sure we find a slot weekly where people that really want to drive this can attend. Uh, I think we should leave this open as well for people to lock around, but we really need, you know, four, five, six people who are interested in this topic to, plus, you know, of course, someone from Yuri, someone from XLA, so Stefan and those kind of people involved and uh, try to uh, write a doc and meet and flesh out and come back to an ODM or an open meeting here when they have you know, more fleshed out idea of reasonable step, problem statements, those kind of things. What, what do you want to do? How does yeah. it sound? 
Yeah, plus plus one on that. Um, I mean, I think that we've been in the state for quite a while where we've got a a uh, we've got a lot of the a lot of the right pieces floating around in different in different corners of of the uh, of the room. Um, we are missing a couple of key things that have been hard to converge upstream, and you know we should find those and focus on them because th those are those are actually holding back a lot of a lot of things. Um, so a smaller group working on that um, might be able to converge them where we haven't before. All right. Um, Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. There are questions from Simon uh, about Tosa. Um, I can, maybe we can take two more minutes just to answer those and then leave it there. Uh, Tosa seems a good convergence point for, from framework. But does it support fully training? Does it support training, Suraj? Or whoever works on Tosa? It's it's got uh, maybe I'll answer it is it's got room for training. Um, that we haven't done as much on training as as on inference, but it it is intended to support training also. Okay. Yeah, I, I um, think that, I, I think that what you'll find is that um, there's a lot of the ops needed in practice. You know, uh, MHLO is, is more built out for for yeah. some of that, but we are talking about op vocabulary stuff largely at that point. Okay, I guess. Well, we'll welcome on, Josh. We'll to tell us something. If... This in the in the doc, right? Moving forward, we'll try to clarify Tosa scope, etc., and involve Tosa people to help clarify that. And another thoughts, but I guess it's not the question for now. It's a question thing that the group yeah. will have also to come back to is the standardized execution model, like what kind of packaging you can distribute. Yeah, I was uh, just kind of trying to break it down into two different focuses that it seems like we we could we could have breakouts on uh, both of those topics. So okay. Thanks Simon. Yep, thanks. All right, we we are very much over time, so I think we're gonna leave it there and move forward with this um uh, work group, sub work group, you know. Uh, and thank you again, Stefan, for bringing this today and for everyone to join uh, and chime in. Uh, Stella, I hope you're going to feel better soon. And yeah, thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Bye, everyone.